to avoid fainting, keep repeating. It's only a movie. Only a movie. Only a movie. In 1972, Wes Craven, a young man of a Baptist fundamentalist upbringing, released what many have considered to be one of the most horrifying and transgressive films of all time. Craven's career spanned five decades and brought us stories of surrealist nightmares, social injustices, and the destruction of the American family. Wes Craven redefined the horror genre for three generations. From the counterculture of the Vietnam era to the resistance of 1980s Reaganomics and the digital landscape and gentrification of the 1990s. Wes Craven brought stories to the screen that reached beyond class, gender, race, and religion. He packaged stories of humanitarian importance into the structures and tropes of the genre film and transcended the boundaries of commercial cinema. What makes Wes Craven a cinema renegade? Let's dive in. After abandoning the world of academia and moving to New York City in the late 1960s to pursue a career in documentary filmmaking, Wes Craven was offered the opportunity to write and direct a feature film for his mentor and contemporary, Sean S. Cunningham. Taking a weekend away from the city to the seclusion of a Connecticut cabin, Craven wrote what would be released to the world as The Last House on the Left. In an interview with Monsterland, Craven states, A lot of it was based on things that I was reading that were going on in Vietnam, you know? Uh, Cutting off the ears and carving the unit name into the dead Kong's chest, just too, too much. The original concept was to make a film that broke barriers, and we broke too many. The Last House on the Left follows teenager Mary Collingwood, who leaves the tranquility of her secluded country home for a concert in the big city. Hoping to purchase marijuana before the show, Mary and her friend Phyllis encounter a group of convicts who promise them drugs only to kidnap them. Taking the girls out into the woods, the group torture, rape, and murder them. After disposing of the bodies, the murderer's vehicle breaks down along a country road, forcing them to stay at a nearby house, the home of Mary's parents. After discovering what has happened to their daughter, the Collingwoods seek revenge, and the hunters soon become the hunted. Taking the basic premise of Ingmar Bergman's The Virgin Spring, Craven created one of the most gruesome films in cinema history. The film is as brutal as the Vietnam footage it was inspired by. The same footage that was broadcast into the television sets of American families everywhere. Challenging viewers to assess the evil within themselves, The Last House on the Left left its audiences dumbfounded, appalled, scared, and even vomiting in their seats. Unable to secure an R rating from the MPAA, producer Sean S. Cunningham had an editor attach an R rating from another film to ensure the film a wide release. Thankfully for Craven and Cunningham, when this was discovered, the statute of limitation was exceeded, and both filmmakers avoided any criminal charges. That did not, however, stop theater projectionists, theater owners, and audience members from striking back. At several screenings, theater owners noted that the audience had violent reactions to the film, even going so far as to storm the projection room to destroy the film print. This animosity toward the picture resulted in many of the prints being returned from distribution with whole scenes extracted from the film. Upon its initial release, many filmgoers were unable to see the film in full until its DVD release in the early 2000s. Hoping that the film would allow for more opportunities in the industry, Craven now found himself a pariah both professionally and socially. Unable to get work as a director for several years, producer Peter Locke approached Wes about writing and directing another horror film set in the desert. Resistant at first, Craven ultimately agreed to the job and started developing The Hills Have Eyes. Released five years after The Last House on the Left, the film is the story of the Carter family's fight for survival against the attacks of a family of cannibalistic inbreds after their car breaks down in an unauthorized airstrike zone. Like the Collingwood family, the Carters go from meat to murder in an attempt to survive. 
Devising a plan of death traps for the cannibals, the Carter family becomes the very violence they are met with, going as far as using the corpse of their mother to lure the aggressors to their demise. Much like Craven's first film, the audience goes from despising the villains to sympathizing with them. In an interview for Rod Sterling's The Twilight Zone magazine, Craven states, I don't want the audience to totally dislike anyone in my films, even the villains in Last House on the Left. After they've killed those girls and done horrible things, the next minute they're doing something very human, like washing up in the lake or trying to be gentlemanly at the table, trying to pass as middle class. Despite what they did, suddenly you sympathize with them. For the family of cannibals, they have never known the modern world. They hunt for food, not for sport. And in an environment where meat is scarce, it is merely the basic need to survive that causes them to hunt the Carter family. Their acts of violence are abhorrent, but their slaying at the hands of the Carter children is equally so. Both Last House and Hills show the destruction of a child's innocence both physically and psychologically. The children in these stories see the acts of violence as reprehensible, yet in the end, many of them end up committing them themselves. And for those who try to stand against the violence, they are met with varied success. The Hills Have Eyes allowed Craven to work with a professional cast and crew for the first time. With a budget of $230,000, one can see the progression in Wes's technical prowess as a filmmaker. The film holds on to the grainy 16mm quality of its predecessor, but its scale and production value includes makeup effects, thrilling stunts, and even an exploding camper. The film was met with critical and commercial success, allowing Craven the opportunity to work in television and gaining him entry into the Directors Guild of America. Segwaying from the violence of the modern American family into the surrealist dreamscapes of the European filmmakers that inspired him, Craven released Deadly Blessing, the story of a young woman whose husband has died under questionable circumstances. Circumstances quite possibly linked to the neighboring religious community. Utilizing misdirection, superstition, and nightmares, Deadly Blessing is a glimpse of what's to come for Craven, who would spend several years pitching his next project to every major player in Hollywood. The project would become Wes's genre-defining masterwork, A Nightmare on Elm Street. Following a group of teenagers who encounter the same razor-gloved boogeyman in each of their nightmares, the friends quickly learn that if killed in their dreams, they are killed in real life. After discovering that the sins of their parents have led to the attacks, Nancy Thompson attempts to pull the boogeyman into the real world to stop him once and for all. Playing off the popularity of the slasher subgenre, Craven reinvented the wheel by blurring the line between dream and reality, and leaving the viewer uncertain of what they were experiencing. Unlike the masked, silent stalkers of his contemporaries, Freddy Krueger was ghoulish, taunting, and manipulative. He enjoyed the pain he inflicted and didn't shy away from it. The film's effectiveness rests on the shoulders of its heroine, Nancy Thompson, who is intuitive, decisive, and strong. Against the advice of doctors, the pressures of parental figures, and the murder of her friends, Nancy realizes that the key to vanquishing Kruger has always lied within herself. To not allow herself to fear her perpetrator, she takes control over him. No fear, no threat. I take back every bit of energy I gave you. You're nothing. You're shit. In Nightmare, Nancy doesn't conform to the path laid out before her. Unlike the Carter children, she refuses to become the very monster her parents have created. She quite literally puts her parent to bed and turns her back on her aggressor, proving that strength doesn't have to come in the form of brutality. From Journal of Popular Film and Television, Craven states, It always fascinates me how people progress, spiritually or consciously, so that they attain a different level from that of the people they emerged from. It's fascinating. It happens at great cost and very rarely. 
but it is possible. The film would go on to become a commercial, critical, and cultural success, launching a franchise that would garner six direct sequels with varied involvement from Craven himself. Freddy Krueger would go on to the Hall of Fame of Horror, becoming a figure commonly seen on the streets among Halloween trick-or-treaters. Although the film was a rousing success, reinventing the oversaturated genre with a fresh vision, Craven reaped little of its rewards. In a midnight hour contract negotiation, Craven signed over the rights of the film and its characters to New Line Cinema, after heavy pressure from producer Bob Shea, who grew tired of waiting for Craven's agent to read over the fine points of the contract. It would be a misstep that would sour Craven's relationship with the production company and his experience working on Elm Street. After Nightmare, Craven would direct his first major studio film for Warner Brothers, titled Deadly Friend, a modern reinvention of Frankenstein based on Diana Hensdale's novel Friend. The film would become a commercial and critical failure, and Craven would return to television with a new version of The Twilight Zone in 1985, directing seven episodes that included the talents of Bruce Willis, Morgan Freeman, and Burgess Meredith. The series allowed Craven to expand himself beyond the horror genre and into the realms of sci-fi, warfare, and comedy. He would return to theater screens with a four-picture deal with a live films. The first of these films, The Serpent and the Rainbow, was loosely based off the non-fiction book written by Wade Davis. Bill Pullman plays Dennis Allen, a Harvard anthropologist who is sent to Haiti by a Boston pharmaceutical company to investigate the rumors of a drug used in voodoo rituals to turn people into zombies. The drug, when administered, causes a person's pulse to become undetectable, thus rendering them dead. The person is then buried, only to emerge from their grave days later. Shot on location in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the film takes a serious approach when representing voodoo, a religious practice that is typically exploited with baseless theory and camp gravitas in the horror films that predate it. Set against the political and civil turmoil of Haiti's 1987 election, the film is an interesting blend of horror, adventure film, political thriller, and avant-garde. Featuring several striking set pieces, there is a maturity to the film that feels stylistically different from Wes's other films. Again, pulling from cinematic giants like Jean Epstein, Louis Bunuel, Jacques Tenet, and Jean Cocteau, Craven puts his own spin on familiar imagery. The film was a moderate success, garnering generally favorable reviews from critics and audiences alike. <laughs> Following this, Craven went on to write and direct Shocker, Universal Studios' call for a profitable villain the likes of Freddy Krueger. During a string of murders in suburban Ohio, Detective Don Parker gets close to discovering the identity of the killer, resulting in the murder of his wife, foster daughter, and youngest foster son. His eldest foster son, Jonathan, informs the detective that he dreamt of the murders, convincing Don with details not yet released to the public. Following the clues in a subsequent nightmare, Jonathan leads the police to Horace Pinker, the serial killer responsible for the crimes. Apprehended in the midst of another murder attempt, Pinker is sentenced to death by electric chair. Having made a deal with the devil, Pinker becomes pure electricity, possessing average citizens to continue carrying out his murderous rampage. Discovering that his birth father is none other than Pinker, Jonathan pursues the murderer into the landscape of television, utilizing a staged broadcast to trap Pinker in physical form to end his reign of terror. Craven used the film to commentate on several topics, the glorification of capital punishment made popular by Reagan's war on crime, the ever-expanding censorship of entertainment due to the belief that it would lead to juvenile delinquency, and even the threat of cinema posed by the growing offerings on television and home video. 
Coming to theaters in the fall of 1989, the film did not strike the same chord with audiences as A Nightmare on Elm Street. Receiving mixed reviews in a lukewarm box office, Horace Pinker would live and die within the confines of a single film, much to Craven's dismay. Craven's third and final film for a live films would be The People Under the Stairs, based on a newspaper article about two burglars who break into a home to find the owner's children in shackles. The film follows Poindexter Fool Williams, a young black boy living in the urban ghetto of Los Angeles. Inhabiting a crumbling apartment complex with his sister and cancer-ridden mother, the family receives an eviction notice from the building's landlords, the Robesons. After hearing from his sister's boyfriend, Leroy, that the Robesons are rumored to have a fortune of gold coins, a fortune that could pay for his mother's necessary operation, Fool agrees to assist Leroy and his friend Spencer by breaking into the Robeson house, posing as a Boy Scout selling cookies. When the tactic ends up being ineffective, Spencer then gets into the house by posing as a municipal worker from the gas company. After witnessing the Robeson's car leave the home without the emergence of Spencer, Leroy and Fool break in to look for him. Inside, they explore the basement, the rumored location of the gold coins, only to discover Spencer's body next to a large pen of mutilated and locked away children. The film becomes a fight for freedom, with Fool evading capture and killing at the hands of Mommy and Daddy Robeson. Two tyrannical believers who see no wrongdoing in their killing and torturing of the children locked away in their house. While exploring the maze-like house for an exit, Fool encounters the Robeson's daughter, Alice, who has endured both physical and emotional abuse at the hands of her parents. The two quickly join forces to fight back against their aggressors to free themselves and the people under the stairs. The film is a parable deconstructing the perception of wealth equating to upstanding citizenship and hard work. It also examines race relations through the urban ghettos created by historical redlining, increased housing rates with lowered standards of upkeep, and the gentrification of urban communities for the profit of white property owners. The film is also a statement on conservatism in America with the broad performances of Wendy Robbie and Everett McGill, inspired by the television evangelist of the 1980s. One could even compare the Robesons to the Reagans, due to their action and inaction that negatively impacts the marginalized communities of the citizens residing in their crumbling dwellings. It's as if we're the prisoners and the criminals roam free. I know what you mean. Audiences who were ready for another Wes Craven fright film got that and more. Unlike Shocker, The People Under the Stairs resonated with audiences. In John Woolley's book, Wes Craven, A Man and His Nightmares, Woolley states, At this point in his career, Craven was secure and confident enough to step out with a movie that was a flat-out parable, delivering an unabashed message that was hard to miss. It's impossible to know whether it was the theme or the horror or both that found favor with fans, but The People Under the Stairs was a hit. Opening in the number one spot in November of 1991 and staying in the top 10 for 10 weeks, the $6 million budget, Craven's largest to date, went on to earn over $31 million in domestic and international receipts. Alive Films would end up shuttering its doors the same year of the film's release, never bringing to fruition Wes's final contractual obligation. But a familiar yet more sinister stalker of dreams would return to him in the early 1990s, catapulting Wes's career and reputation to new heights. Miss me. Hey everyone, this is Zach from Cinema Renegade. Thanks for watching part one of Wes Craven, Cinema Renegade. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and we'll see you for part two.